morning, and let me welcome you to the Crossings Church on this Sunday morning. If you are visiting with us today, we are thrilled that you're here, and I hope you know that you are our guests, and we want to honor you. And we believe that God brought you and each of us here for a significant reason. I grew up going to church every Sunday and expecting nothing to happen. And some of that was because of me, and some of that was because of the church that I was a part of, but none of it was really true. God wanted Sunday morning to begin something or to continue something in my life that would make a difference not only through the week, but through all my life and even into eternity. And if you're visiting with us or if you're a member this morning, you need to know the same is true for you. And it's up to you to allow God to do that. But no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what you have struggled with, no matter how many times you have fallen down, God still has plans for your life, and if you'll turn to him, he can do some amazing things. It's our ministry fair Sunday, and it's a different kind of Sunday. So this, is not, this, is, this won't be a normal service if we ever have a normal service. Kind of uh, uh, weird people can't have normal services, I don't think. But uh, if we, uh, if this will not be what's normal. But we're in a series called More Than Words, and it's a series that's looking at some biblical words, words that we use commonly almost from day to day, that have lost their meaning either through overuse or through misuse. And several weeks ago, we start with the, started with the word faith. And we found out that the big, biblical word for faith, that there are different kinds of faith, that there's a kind of faith that saves us, and there's a kind of faith that can leave us lost and separated from God. That faith is more than an intellectual belief. It is a surrender to God in trust. It's aligning ourselves with someone that we're loyal to because we really do believe in them. Last week, we transitioned to the word love. And as we examine what the word love meant, we know there's a thousand uses for it. But when you try to define what love is in Scripture, it is a verb. It's an action word. And we looked at a passage of Scripture that covered a story called the Good Samaritan, where Jesus was asked the question, what is it I need to do to inherit eternal life? And his answer was, you need to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then he explained what that looked like by telling a story of the Good Samaritan. That love is a verb. It's somebody who takes action. Today, the reason that we, we picked love last week and this week is because in the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus spelled love, S-E-R-V-E. And all through Scripture, if you want a definition of what love is, if you want an explanation of what love is, if you look in the context of Jesus and Scripture, you'll find out that it almost always has to do with serving, the kind of love that Jesus calls to putting somebody else's good above ours and meeting their needs even above our own. So this week, we're transitioning from Luke 10, where Jesus said, here's the greatest commandment, uh, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then he told us, if you're loving your neighbor and if you're loving God, you're serving both of them. We're going to see the truth that love is illustrated again by Jesus in acts of service. And we're going to be in John chapter 13, which happens just a few hours before Jesus will leave this world. And I want to give you on your notes, to start off with, there's a major premise, you'll see that, there's a minor premise, and then there's a therefore. And normally you have major premise, minor premise, and conclusion, but since it's biblical, we got the therefore. But the major premise we start with is, is this, love motivated Jesus to come to earth to serve me. And if we talk about the major premise of Christianity, that is it. And what you need to know that everything else after that is not the major premise of Christianity. Because Christianity does not start off with what you need to do for God. It does not start off with a command that some preacher is giving you to you need to make sure you serve and that you give. It starts off with Jesus coming to this world to serve you and I. And in John chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says this as it records the last week or so of Jesus. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and to go back to the Father. Jesus loved his own who were in the world, and he loved them to the end. So it says from the time Jesus got here to the time that he left, he loved them, even in the difficult times. So as he's loving them, it says while supper was taking place, Jesus got up from the table 
removed his outer clothes and took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with a towel that, was, that he had tied around his waist. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter asked, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Now, what I want you to note again is in the story of the Good Samaritan, love is connected with service. And as this verse starts off with what Jesus is going to, that he loved his disciples in the world, for the rest from this day forward till the end of Jesus' life, love will be equated with service. Service by washing the feet of the disciples or service by dying on the cross so that their sins can be washed away. But Jesus came in order to serve you and I. And that's not something that we should be shocked by because Jesus got this giving, serving, loving emphasis. And again, when I say serve, I hope that after this lesson you'll go, okay, when I hear serve in last week's, I think love and whatever I hear love, I think serve. In John chapter 3, in verse 16, in the Amplified Version, the Bible says, For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten unique son, so that whoever believes in him, trusts in, clings to him, relies on him, shall not perish, come to destruction, be lost, but have eternal, everlasting life. He says, God loved us so much that in an act of service, he sent his son, and again, notice the connection between love and service. And he said he did that so that all of us would believe in him. And that's that word pistis that we talked about two weeks ago in the sermon. It means more than just an intellectual belief. It means more than a casual acknowledgement. But it literally means that you're going to trust him, that you're going to be someone who clings to him, somebody who relies on him. That's the kind of faith that God calls us to. And he called us to that kind of faith by showing us the kind of love that serves. You see, the hero of the Good Samaritan story that we talked about last week when we began talking about love is an unlikely hero. He is a Samaritan. And in that day, if you know anything, especially about the Jewish relationship to the Samaritans, it was a hostile relationship. The Jews felt the Samaritans were worthless, and because of that prejudice, the Samaritans didn't particularly like the Jews. So as Jesus tells this story about a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan, two of these are viewed by good by the hearers, and one of them is viewed as bad. They might ask the question, can anything good come out of Samaria? And while that question is not directly asked about it, about the Samaritan, it is asked about another biblical figure. You remember who that was? When Nathaniel was being introduced to the possibility that the Messiah was there, his friends came and said, we found the Messiah. And then he was told that he comes from Nazareth. And Nathaniel asked back and says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So as you look at the story of the Good Samaritan, it's an unlikely hero from a place to where they didn't think anything good would really come out of or happen. And the hero in the story of the Good Samaritan finds a man who has been attacked by evil ones is broken down and cannot save himself. The man that is attacked is on his way to sure death if someone does not enter his world and save him, but to save him, they have to serve him. It's a story of mercy and grace. It's a story of love, and it ought to sound familiar to you because it's really the story of what Jesus did for us. He came from a town that nobody expected, Nazareth, to have anything good happen in fulfillment of prophecy. He knew that we had been attacked by the evil one, and that because of that, our eternal life was threatened. And if he doesn't step in, we would never have the wherewithal to be able to be saved. And so he steps in and models life as a servant for us and dies on the cross as a servant for us. And he is the hero of our story. And it's why in the first century church, when they thought about Jesus, the servant that came to earth to save those that were beaten up and broken, they did it consistently. Every week in the first century church, there is evidence biblically and historically that they would take partake of the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper is God's way of making sure that we know the major premise of Christianity begins with what Jesus did for us. 
It's not the only premise. But the major premise is that Jesus came to this world because he loved us. And when you love, Luke tells us in the story of the Good Samaritan, when you love, you have to serve. It's the natural byproduct of what happens when you authentically love. So every Sunday they would get together, and they were a mixed-up lot. You see, the first century church started off being primarily Jewish, and then it had the Gentiles introduced to it later on. And the world in that time was corrupt, sexual immorality. Everything that we struggle with in this culture, everything that we would say, man, the culture's going to hell in a handbasket, it was in spades in the time that Jesus was here. And so these mixed-up people that God had put back together would get together to be reminded that while they had a part in Christianity, the great part was done by Jesus. And they would take bread and they would say, this is his body that represents his sacrifice for us. That was beaten just because he loved us, he allowed it to happen, because he cared that much for all those of us who were along the road, beat up and helpless. And then would they take the cup and they would say, this, this, this wine or this fruit of the vine represents the blood of Jesus that was shed so that we could be forgiven. And they would drink those emblems knowing that they were loved deeply, that they were pardoned completely. And they would go on in the service knowing that he resurrected so he had the power to change them to be whatever they needed to be. That they didn't have to stay broken, they didn't have to stay guilty, but instead they would become the representatives who would share the message of forgiveness, of healing, and hope as they served Jesus and as they served others. Before we jump into today's lesson and, and just go on with that, we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. And it's a regular weekly occurrence at the crossings, whether we do it either on our Sunday morning assembly or in our small groups when they meet uh, on those weeks. But right now, I want us to just take a moment to, to remember Jesus, to look at the bread and the wine, and know that it is a testimony to someone who loved us, to someone who served us, to the very end. Would you bow and pray with me? Father, right now we're about to take emblems that it's very, very easy for those just to become normal and commonplace. And Father, it's my prayer that we won't allow those significant emblems to become insignificant in our life. And Father, as we think about the Lord's Supper and how Jesus loved us enough to die for us, that love is bound up in service. That agape love is not a feeling as much as it is a choice and an expression of a choice to value someone and to do something good for them. Father, there's all kinds of Greek words you know for love, but the one that Jesus displayed for us, the one that he calls for us, is a love that naturally, that compulsively, that can't keep from serving. And Father, as we take those emblems, I pray that we will see ourselves as that person that's beat up along the side of the road. That, Father, that we could never save ourselves, that we weren't deserving of salvation, but because of your grace and your kindness, because of Jesus' love, he came knowing every moment of terror, every moment of pain, every moment of difficulty, because, Father, that's what love does to those that are loved. And he served us, Father. And Father, right now, no matter where we are, the truth is the Bible teaches that Jesus didn't come because we were his friends. We came because he came because we were his enemies in need of forgiveness. Father, there are those here that have taken advantage of that forgiveness from Jesus, and there are those here today who feel guilty and feel as if God really wouldn't want them, that God wouldn't care for them because of what they've done, where they've been. And the truth is Jesus came knowing all of that to say, I love you, and I want to serve you in a way that allows you to have the best life now that you can possibly have, and the only life you'd want in eternity. Father, thank you for your blood. Thank you for your service. In the name of Jesus, amen. He came to live, to live, live a perfect to be, to be a living word of life. He came to die, to die so we'd be reconciled. He came to rise, to, rise, to 
So the major premise, the major premise of today's lesson is that Jesus, the love of Jesus motivated him to come to earth to serve you and I. The minor premise is this, love motivated Jesus to come to make me a servant. That he came to serve me, he came to love me, but in loving and serving me, his goal was to do more than just to simply leave me with an awareness that I had been loved and served. But Jesus came to make me someone who was a loving service. So Jesus comes to Peter and he's asked as he's washing the feet of the disciples, which was a common task that a servant or the youngest child would do. Peter is going to score some brownie points, it seems like, by being different than all the other disciples and say, are you going to wash my feet? And resist that in a false sense of, of humility. The Bible says in John chapter 13, beginning in verse 12, after Jesus had washed their feet, he took his place at the table again. Then he asked his disciples, do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right because that's what I am. So if I am your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you must wash each other's feet. I've given you an example that you should follow in. Now, here's the thing that we need to recognize. When he said he's given them an example, through the centuries there has been a debate as to whether Jesus is saying that in our church services we ought to wash each other's feet. And I don't think that's what he is saying. In their day, in the particular world that they lived in, it was a world of sandaled and bare feet people in a time when the emissions were not gases that went to the air, but it was more solids that went to the ground from the, their, their mode of transportation. Feet naturally got dirty, and it was an unhealthy and unwholesome thing to try to eat lunch with somebody sitting to you like that. 
But there's been this debate, but what Jesus is really trying to make us understand, both in the story of the Good Samaritan and in the story that he tells in John chapter 13, is I'm not wanting you guys to focus on an act of service. Whether it would be binding somebody, helping somebody who's broke down and beaten up along the side of the road, or whether it would be washing the, somebody's feet. What I'm trying to get you guys to be, not just to do, I'm trying to get you to be a servant at heart. It's a lot more about our character than it is simply following out a specific command of Jesus. You see, acts of service can be manipulated. Remember his last week and in the text when, whenever Jesus has asked the question, what is it that I need to do to etern- inherit eternal life? The person who asked him question gets an answer from Jesus that you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You love your neighbor as yourself, but he doesn't like the answer because probably he feels guilty. He knows that love is, is more than a mere thing feeling it's an action and he's not doing that so he asked another question and the bible says that he asked it wanting to justify himself it's not a question that's asked out of sincerity he's trying to manipulate the situation and you see we can do that with acts of service have you ever been in a situation to where you did something that was right with a completely wrong motive maybe if you were a teenager and you're parents are going somewhere and they're saying, hey, I told you to have this house clean and I'm not leaving till you clean it. Well, I clean the house and you tell them, oh, I will make sure I clean the house. I've been there and I've done this. And so you're cleaning the house and they're going, now, doesn't that look much better? And you're thinking, yes. And then they thank you, thank you, thinking, man, they have learned, you've, look, they served and they did what they should have done. The truth is you weren't serving out of any motive that was noble. You just wanted your parents out of the house so you could do what you wanted to do. It was a manipulation. And it's not just teenagers. It's us, we as adults can do the same thing. To where we serve, but it's not really about love because love is about others. So we serve and somehow it becomes all about us. It becomes self-serving and manipulative in the situation. As you look at the story of Jesus and he's washing the disciples' feet, I think that Peter would have said, are you going to wash my feet? Before Jesus could ever let Peter go on, I think Peter would have said, no, I'm going to wash your feet. But I don't believe Peter would have been doing that out of a noble Christ-likeness in his character. I think Peter would be doing what he usually tried to do, and that was to make himself look bad, better by saying or doing something that would please Jesus if the motive were right. You see, ultimately, it's not about the acts of service you or I do. It's not about what ministry you might pick out today. Go, man, I want to, get, I want to be a part of that ministry. It's not about how many old people I help across the street. It's about being a servant at heart like Christ was a servant at heart. And Christ always emphasizes the heart above everything else. Because you see, you can be a manipulator. You can go to church, you can serve, you can go to cross chat, you can, you can invite people to church, and you can do all of that and miss being like Jesus. And in missing being like Jesus, you'll end up doing more harm than good. But here's the thing, if you shoot for a heart like Jesus, if you're a servant If that's who you are, not simply something that you do, no matter what you find yourself, situation you find yourself in, if you have the heart of Jesus, you're going to act like Jesus. If you have the heart of Jesus and you see someone who's beaten up along the side of the road, what are you going to do? If you have the heart of Jesus, you're going to stop. If you're someone who has the heart of Jesus and you come come into the assembly, what are you going to do? When you see someone in need, when you see a spot that needs cleaned up, When you see a person who needs comforting, when you see someone who's experienced a tragedy, when you see someone who needs encouragement, whatever act of service you'll need to do, you'll do because you're like Jesus. Jesus came not to get me to do servant acts. That stuff is, when you just shoot for an action, it's so open to manipulation and hypocrisy. But when you shoot to be a servant like Jesus, it is so so complete in its way of consuming us. It is so consuming that it makes us 
make the world better whether we're here or whether we're somewhere else. So you see, the major premise is that Jesus came to earth to serve me. The minor premise is that love motivates Jesus to come to make me a service. Therefore, the conclusion is this. Loving Jesus entails being served and serving others. That if I'm really going to love the way that God called me to love, I am going to serve others, but I am also going to be served by others. Peter has asked that question, are you going to wash my feet too? Peter looked at Jesus and said, you'll never wash my dirty feet. But Peter, if you don't allow me to wash your feet, Jesus responded, then you'll not be able to share life with me. So Peter said, Lord, in that case, don't just wash my feet, wash my hands and my head too. That Jesus is trying to fulfill the greatest command and Peter is bound to be served. And he says, listen, if you won't have the humility to be served, then you're not going to be able to have a relationship with me. That loving Jesus means that we allow him to serve us. That we allow others to serve us. Because what happens when you have a group of people who just want to come in and serve Jesus? Serving is a great thing, but can I let you know that sometimes it is easier to serve than it is to be served. Serving becomes a way, again, that we can promote ourselves, that we can look better. And the problem is when you have people who are just seeking to look better and are not becoming better, you have something that's potentially dangerous because you have hypocrisy in the mix that's there. Loving Jesus entails being served and serving others. In a moment, I'm, in a little bit, I'm going to dismiss you all for a few minutes to go around and look at the ministry booths that are here. And as you go around, I hope that you will understand that, listen, that God provided all of this to allow the church to fulfill the greatest commandment, and that is to love each other. Loving each other means that we are serving each other, because if Jesus doesn't, if Peter doesn't allow Jesus to serve him, Peter goes unchanged, and Peter has no impact. In Luke 22, Jesus is talking to Peter and saying, Peter, you're going to blow it. You're going to mess it up. And he says, I prayed for you, though, Simon. It's another name for Peter. I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail so that when you recover, strengthen the other disciples. Peter, I'm going to go serve you. You're not going to understand that fully. But I'm praying for you that when you're strong that you'll go out and serve others. That the same thing I'm serving you in the way I'm serving you, you will serve others. In 2 Peter 1, Peter has his name on a book. In 2 Peter 1, 1, the Bible says, I, here's how he identifies himself. I, Simon Peter, am a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Do you notice he starts off with servant, not apostle? You see, he's got the servant part down. The apostleship identifies a specific ministry he's serving in. But Peter's emphasis is, Jesus, I'm your servant. So wherever you need me, I'll be a servant. You need me to wash feet, I'll do that. You need me to proclaim the message, I'll do that because I am a servant and I know that loving you means being served and serving others. In 1 John 3, 16, 17, and 23, because of space and time, John wrote these words. He said, we know what true love looks like because of Jesus. He gave his life for us and he calls us to give our lives for our brothers and sisters. If a person owns the things we need to make it in this world, and that person, by the way, the context is within this, he's talking to the church family. He's saying, hey, if 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 you're a member of the church, you have the stuff that can help the other people out and you don't do it. That's the context. If a person owns the things we need to make it in this world but refuses to share those with those in need, is it even possible that the love of God lives in him? If he's not willing to use his stuff or if he or she is not willing to use their stuff to serve, he goes... That's a clear indication that they don't love. Why? Because, again, you see those words connected, love and service. He goes on to say, his command is clear. Believe in the name of his son, Jesus the anointed, and love one another as he commanded. And if you read through 1 John, there's a huge emphasis on the kind of love that God God commands is not a feeling or simply a statement but it's actions that are done in love and deed. In Philippians 2, Paul writes this, and he says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset to Christ. 
Now, he's telling them that he wants them to do servant acts, but he's telling them more. He's saying, dude, if you're a believer, you're not supposed to just do an act of service. You are to be a servant. Have the mindset or the mind, another translation says, of Christ. He emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. That word form has to do with it's the essence of who he is. He had the essence of a servant. So here's the thing. Jesus came to serve me. Jesus came to love and serve me. Jesus called me to serve. Jesus called me to lovingly serve others. And loving Jesus entails not just serving, but being served and serving others. It's a vital reality that we grasp. In John 14, 14, Jordan 14, 15, there may be a typo there. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do, you will obey my commandments. And here's the thing that's clear in Scripture. There's a lot of little specific commands that you could pick out that Jesus commands us to do. But there is an overriding command to be lovers of people. And that involves serving. And it is very clear that the call is not do a sir act of service, but it's to be a servant. We're going, what we're going to do right now is we're going to allow everybody for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, we're inviting everybody to, to just walk around, and there will be people, if you're in a booth right now, if you're manning a booth, you can go ahead and get up and go to that booth. If you're not in a booth, ignore the rude people that are leaving right now and just pay attention to me, okay? If you are, if, but everybody in Manning those booths, there are booths all around here. And in the booths, there are two things, if you notice on the back of your notes, that you need to be thinking about. And we'll come back and cover this more. You're looking for the ministry that you will utilize to be loved by, to be served by, because you have a need for that, or you're looking for the ministry where you will choose to love and serve someone else. And there's all kinds of ministry we have. If we start with my immediate left, there's a ministry that we had at one point. It's one of the most difficult ministries to keep going. It's a ministry that I've been associated with probably 25 years now. It's a ministry for people who struggle with addictions, hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And the problem is that ministry tends to collapse in most churches under the weight of the selfishness of, the, of those who have got help from that ministry but aren't willing to help with that ministry. My, one of my closest friends in life was a heroin addict that I worked with for years. And he and I used to discuss, is an addict an addict because they're selfish or are they selfish because they are addicts? After about six years of being a Christian, he said, Robert, I am completely certain now that I was wrong. We're selfish, and that's why we're addicts. It's not the other way around. I've always been selfish, and I'm just coming to realize that. It's a booth that we're just, but we have a Celebrate Recovery table over there that we're doing a, just an opening for people who would like to help or like to get help from that ministry. And it involves hurts, habits with it for anything from addictions to drugs to alcohol to pornography to codependence, all of that's involved in that ministry. Next to it is another ministry that we have started, and it's been going for a few years now. It's called Comforting Rachel. It's for ladies who chose to have abortions and are struggling with the guilt that that choice brings into their life. We had an incredible young lady who led that ministry for us for several years who had had multiple abortions but she contracted COVID a few, a couple of months ago now, and she passed away from COVID pneumonia. To the very most last moment of her life, she was thinking about how to help ladies experience the forgiveness, the grace, and the hope that she did. And Victoria is manning that booth. She's on our church plant at the Interbelt. Victoria was, was, was a part of Shelley's ministry. And Shelley Martin is gone, but Shelley Martin lives. through Victoria, and young ladies like her who decide, I'm not going to just keep it a secret and struggle. I'm going to deal with it, and I'm going to help let other people know that they can have help. You can go around. You're going to find if we just go around. I don't know what we have down here, but I know I'm looking back at boiling points, which is you've got a problem with anger that you can't overcome. Great place for that. There's all kinds of booths that maybe you need help ser being served. 
There's a Levite ministry over here that there are the, the two bald guys in the booth over there. Just follow, just follow the reflection, okay? Uh, <laughs> I think you guys should have put some master turf on there, okay? Just saying. But there are booths where you can serve and that matters. But for some of you, you need to stop trying to look good. You need to start trying to become good to deal with your hurts, your habits, and your hang-ups, whatever that might be. So I'm going to pray, and we're let you going to go till 20 minutes after, and we'll call you back. The worship team will call you back with a song. When the song begins, let me encourage you, unless you want to be here an extended period of time, let me encourage you when the song begins to, to finish your discussion really quickly to sign the thing that's there if you want to. For the CR ministry, there'll be some sign-up uh, recoveries, uh, places you can sign up if you're interested in helping or getting help. There's also some cards over there you can sign up at crossingcr at gmail.com. You can just send a, a, a name with your contact information. In it. Would you bow and pray with me? Father, I love Ministry Fair Sunday because sometimes I forget all the stuff that you are doing in our lives. And from things like things that is, as simple but significant as people who make sure that the assembly is decorated and that things look presentable for, for, for holidays like Easter and, and Christmas and just from week to week to make a cold gem more alive. Father, to things like the, the, the common grounds, coffee that is served, Father, in a way that's designed to help people know that they're cared for. And Father, as I go around for our kids' ministry, our campus ministry, Father, it's just cool to see all that you're doing, but I know beyond that, in doing all of that, you're transforming, lot, transforming lives through providing service to those like the man that was beat up on the road, like the disciples whose feet were dirty and smelly. You're providing an opportunity to be served in a life-changing way. But you're also, Father, providing opportunities to serve in incredibly significant and life-changing ways. So, Father, during this next 20 minutes or so, God, just help us just to relax and just to enjoy the time. And Father, you know, it's one of those things to where it can be so tense sometimes at church that we get away from what you design, a family of God coming together to let people know that we have a great Father who can help them through whatever it is they're struggling with. So Father, my prayer right now is that people will ask the question, is this a ministry that I could serve in to help others? And is this a ministry that I could get help from to become more like your son? Father, again, thank you for this time. Help us to have a great time. In the name of Jesus, amen. Right, if you'll pick up your notes there, you'll notice that we talked about the major premise, the minor premise, and a therefore. The therefore is that we're going to choose to be served and we're going to choose to serve. Both of those are designed to make us better. But there's a serendipity part also. And serendipity, you know, if, if, it's, uh, serendipity is the, the cherry on the top of the, the Sunday. It's something that's really good that you didn't necessarily expect to get. And here's the serendipity part if you choose to embrace what we're talking about. I will be blessed by being loved and loving Jesus and others. I will be blessed by being loved and loving Jesus and others. That ultimately, all this stuff we're talking about, serving, you go, man, I just, what am I going to do? But can I give that much? Well, the truth is the Bible says there's more blessing in getting than giving than in receiving. And when you choose to be served, some of us in this in this gymnasium day, understand how our life was changed when we humbled ourselves and acknowledged that we couldn't do it alone. We couldn't do it alone with our parenting. We couldn't do it alone with our marriage. We couldn't do it alone with our compulsive behaviors and our addictions and our struggles. We couldn't overcome our abuse by ourselves. But when we were served, we found a blessing that was amazing, but it was not just in being served that we found the blessing, that we found it in a blessing when we serve others. In John 13, as Jesus is ending up the foot washing of his disciples and trying to teach them, here's what he said. Now that you know these things, major premise, minor premise, conclusion. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You see, the truth is the happiest people in the world are those who are serving. And some of the most discouraged and distressed people are those who are selfish. You want to know how loved you are? Make a list 
If you're a teen, let me encourage you to do this. If you're a husband, if you're living a household with someone, make a list of all the things that you have done that have been done for you in the last week. Or maybe this week, start with a list when you guys get up, you college students, you high school husbands and wives, moms and dads, everybody, and just make a list on Monday night. Here's how I've been served. Here's how today this, somebody did this, somebody did this. Every act of service that you get, and at the end of the week, you look back and you go, man, this is how much I was loved this week because this is how much I was served. On the other hand, I want to encourage you to make a list of the ways that you love those in your household. What have you done to serve somebody today? You see, what's been, how you've been served shows how much you were loved. How much you serve those around you shows how much you love others. And you need both to have a blessed life. Inside of your worship bulletin this morning, there's a cardstock piece of paper I want to encourage you to, to, to pull out. Uh, it says on one side, and I don't have one with me, on one side it's our communication card. It says that where the, uh, the crossing church where the problems of life meet the power of God. And those, that intersection of problems and power, that intersection is between whenever you allow yourself to be loved and served, where you open yourself up to Christ to allowing him to change you, and you open yourself up to Christ to allow him to help you change others. I don't know where you are this morning, but here is the, the major premise. Jesus died for you, and because he loved you, he asked you to trust him about what a good life is. So on that card, if you're here and you don't know where to start, you go, well, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know I believe in God. I don't know if I believe in Jesus. I don't know. You know, I've got a lot of resentment. If you don't know where to start, check, I'd like a personal Bible study. And somebody who lives in your area, or if you had a friend, you know, walking around the booths with you today, that person will come with their small group leader, and they'll sit down and show you what it looks like to get to know Jesus and to become a follower. Maybe you're here and you're listening to these lessons on faith and you understand it's about trusting God and surrendering to him completely and loving others and you've been unwilling to do that because you think that somehow if you're your own God, you're going to do better. The truth is you won't. And if you're ready to make Jesus your Lord, to trust yourself, entrust yourself to him, to align yourself with him, to really believe in him, check I'd like to be baptized. And again, somebody there will, somebody will show up and they will help you to, to understand what baptism is about in scripture. Maybe you're here and you have some issues with God. Maybe you've got issues in a divorce. Maybe you've got issues with addiction. Maybe you've got issues with abuse that happened in your past that you just can't understand. Why would God let that happen? I understand that very personally. That's my story. But what I want you to know is that you've got some good questions, but God and the people here who've experienced that, whether it would be through the wounded heart for men or women or Celebrate Recovery or anger management, they've got some good answers that God can provide to give you answers and to change your life. I hope you'll take that, that card and you'll drop that card, fill it out, and drop it in the basket. I'm going to pray right now, and then I'll give you some instructions. Would you bow with me? Father, right now, our worship team is going to sing a song that's designed to get us to think and to meditate meditate about what you would want us to do. And Father, it's so easy just to, to do things the way we always do them, and that's usually what do I want to do. But Father, faith says that we consider what you want and we trust it. And Father, love says that we choose to act in service. We do something. So Father, I pray right now that people go, God, what do you want me to write on that card? It may be uncomfortable to ask about a Bible study. I don't know anything, but none of us do when we started. It may be hard to admit that I had an abortion, but it's never going to get any better unless I get some help. It may be hard to acknowledge that I've been abandoned by my spouse or I have abandoned my spouse. But Father, until those issues are addressed, peace will never come. Father, there are people here who just need to say, I just need to surrender everything to you. They know that you are the Son of God. They know that Jesus is the only way to heaven, and yet somehow, Father, we resist surrendering to you in faith and baptism. So I don't know what people need to, need to check. But Father, I pray this morning they'll do two, two or three things, I guess, that they'll check whatever it is that you lead them to check, and that they'll drop the card in the baskets as they're past in a minute. For our members, we need their card and their contribution. For our guests, we ask only for the card. We ask them not to give money, but we ask them to give you a chance. So, Father, move us, I pray, to do something. Father, faith is more than a feeling. It's a response to you. Love is more than an emotion. It is doing something. And so, Father, I pray that we know that as we hear your word, that it does no good, as James says. We deceive ourselves if we hear the word and do nothing. So help us to do something today 
that can make a difference in our week and our forever. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.